Stewart. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise tonight to talk about an issue that, in fact, I haven't talked about for some time in this chamber, and that is the impact of the Montara oil spill. Last month, I visited East Noosa Tangara, uh, West Timor, to meet with um, officials there, to meet with fishers, um, community members, and seaweed farmers. And it looks like the Montara oil spill has had a significant impact on that, um, on those communities, and I'll go into that shortly. But before I do, I would like to remind us about where this started, and that was on the 21st of August in 2009, when the Montara wellhead exploded um, in Australian waters, or in the Australian waters of the Timor Sea, and of course spilt um, thousands and thousands of litres of oil into the ocean. How much we don't know because that was never officially measured. Um, that oil gushed unchecked for till the 3rd of November for 74 days. The oil was carried um, quite long distances by the currents, and the sheen upon the ocean at various times affected areas as large as 90,000 square kilometres. It was the largest offshore oil uh, platform spill in Australia's history. And the uh, AMSA, the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, dispersed um, dispersants on the oil um, at estimates they told me 184,135 uh, litres of um, dispersants. Um, those, some of those dispersants, such as Corex uh, 9527A and Corex 9500, um, um, were used, and they have subsequently been shown to. Um, be toxic, some, one, uh, some uh, much more highly um, toxic than people uh, were aware of. They've been linked to uh, dam damage to human and mar uh, marine life and to severe health consequences. Um, those uh, uh, dispersants were also used um, in the deep water horizon spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, just reminding the chamber that in 2010, the report of the Montara Commission of Inquiry, that was in fact the inquiry that was established by the Australian government, found that um, the way in which the company responsible, which is PPTTP uh, Australasia, um, operated the Montara oil field, and I quote, did not come within a bull, bull, bull's roar of sensible oil field practice. The blowout, um, they said, was not a reflection of an unfortunate incident or of bad luck. What happened was an accident waiting to happen. Um, PTTP have subsequently um, fined and, in fact, uh, then had to put in place a, a plan of action, uh, action plan to address the uh, bad and poor practices that, were un that um, resulted in this spill, and in fact the government of the, um, the previous government significantly amended the oil and gas regulations in Australia. And I will remind the chamber that the Northern Territory government at that time was responsible for the regulation, and the uh, inquiry also found uh, very, uh, uh, very poor management of the regulatory process, and that's also changed. At the time. Um, of the spill, um, that it was established that the oil spill did go into Indonesian waters. Um, at first, there was some dispute with the company about whether that in had in fact happened. And fortunately, satellite imagery, not provided by the government or the company, but in fact by SkyTruth, clearly established that. Um, the local community um, in uh, Nusa uh, Tenggara also uh, uh, provided um, some oil uh, samples. Um, which I then provided to the uh, Commission of Inquiry, and it was established that oil that had gone into Indonesian waters um, was, in fact, oil from the Montara oil spill. What wasn't tracked, or I don't think understood at the time, was that the use of the dispersants um, with the oil um, creates what they call a mousse, and it changes the, the particles and drops them out of, for a start, drops them out of the um, off the surface into the uh, water profile, but also apparently causes a mousse that causes the spread of the oil and the damage uh, much further. At the time, um, and I did speak about this in the chamber on several occasions, at the time the people of Rotti 
and of um, East Noosa Tangara also highlighted that they were extremely concerned about the impact of the oil spill on fishers who are legally allowed to fish in the area that was affected by the oil, but also on seaweed farms. The government, Australian government worked with the company to ensure that there were studies done in Australian waters. Unfortunately, there was no studies done in Indonesian waters. So we have no understanding of what, this spill, what impact this spill had on Indonesian waters, on the fish stocks in Indonesian waters, on Roti and on um, East Nusa Tenggara. So um, I was invited up to speak at a, a seminar two weeks ago um, in um, West Timor, which I um, was very fortunately enough able to um, attend. And at that time, I also um, went, uh, met with communities. I went to um, a community called Tablalong, where, in fact, 800 um, concerned community members came um, to, um, to a public meeting. There were so many people, many people in the, in the church, in fact it was held in a church, and many people outside. And I got to hear their accounts of what has happened to them and the impact that, that, that has been felt by their communities. So here you have um, communities that um, had, some of them recent, fairly recently gone into seaweed farming as a way of, um, of obviously of earning um, income. And I heard how their production had um, fallen very significantly from um, many uh, 500, for example, in the, in the village in which I, I met, from 500 tonnes production of seaweed to 10 tonnes. I heard from, in fact, the regional fisheries officer where how um, production of fish had gone down from what was originally around 180,000 tonnes down to what is now 70,000 tonnes. I heard from the fishers how red snapper, lobster, sardines, now they couldn't fish um, those. They couldn't catch them, in fact, have had to change their fishing grounds. And, and instead of having to travel two days to their fishing grounds, they now have to take up to seven days to travel. I heard how the number of boats in these villages, um, fishing boats, had significantly reduced from hundreds to less than a hundred in many of the villages, how fishers had lost their jobs because um, they could no longer fish. Now the point here is we don't know if this is the if the drop in production of seaweed farming, because what's happened is the production has dropped right off. They're now a scaly disease on these seaweed farms and people are no longer able to make their livelihoods from seaweed farming. Fishers, as I've articulated, are no longer to fish. Um, Tabralong, the village that um, we had the public meeting in, you could tell it was once a very prosperous village um, because of the seaweed farming. Other villages, again, very prosperous. They, uh, you could see they were in decline because they could no longer um, uh, either fish or um, seaweed farm. We don't know if, in fact, the Montara oil spill has caused this damage and the dispersants. I've got to say the oil and the dispersants, because we don't know whether that moose I was talking about or the dispersants or the oil has impacted on these villages and on these on fishing and on seaweed farms. But we owe it to these communities to, to have a look. And so that's what the community's message to me was, please ask the Australian government to take some leadership here. Please ask them to require a study to be undertaken. And I believe it's incumbent on the Australian government to take that leadership because it was our poor regulatory practice, along with the company, and I'll get to the company in a minute, it, along with the company, who have a responsibility. It was failures by both. It was failures of our regulatory practice and, and gross failures on the company's behalf. So the company has a responsibility. But if they are not going to take up the responsibility, we need leadership by the Australian government to, put, to require a study to be done of what these impacts are. I heard from, impact, uh, from experts at the seminar that I was at that you could still do the studies and still establish whether the oil and the dispersants, because of particular marking, chasing the markers process, you can study whether that's still in the marine environment, still in the sediments. So we can establish whether it has had an impact. We owe it to those communities to carry out those studies. And I urge the Australian government to take some leadership here, and I desperately urge the company, PTTEP Australasia, to please 
talk to these fishers, put the money into the study, and let's establish the re what's really happened to these uh, villages.